back to New York, at least virtually, Reverend Walter LaFour. For eight years, he served the UU congregation in our neighbor Poughkeepsie. And on a special note for me, Walter's wife is my friend of many years and many joys, Yvette. And I'm so I got to say hi to her this morning, and that was extraordinary. I'm delighted that Reverend Walter is here with us this morning, and he's going to share his thoughts on our first and last Unitarian principles. Reverend Walter. Thank you, thank you. And I just want to note that uh, Linda's notion of seeing Yvette, whom I didn't know they knew each other, speaks to how small the world is. <laughs> I hope the title of my sermon today, The Last Shall Be First and the First Last, might prompt you to think of one of the more memorable verses in the Bible. It's Matthew 20, 16. I went and looked it up to make sure I was quoting the verse correctly. The verse has universal meaning. This morning, I wanna hold up the importance of universality but more specifically, universes, universalism. The backstory of the verse is about a landowner who hired laborers to work in the vineyard. Some were hired early in the day, others hired later at different times during the same day. So at the end of the day, the landowner paid those hired during the latter part of the day he paid them first. They received the same compensation as those who were hired earlier in the day. Not surprisingly, those who were hired first, those who had worked the longest hours, they complained. Say, whoa, wait, just a minute. I worked all day. Those guys only worked a few hours, yet, yet you paid them the same as me. Landowner explained, they were being paid a full day's wages. So he said, what's the fuss? You're getting exactly what we agreed to when you were hired. You're not getting cheated out of anything. He told them that his money was his money and that he had the right to be generous if he chose. The following verses in Matthew do not tell us whether or not that satisfied those particular laborers. I think there's a wonderful parable that speaks to universalism. Universalism is a philosophical, a theological orientation that speaks to a fundamental truth, universal reconciliation. Theologically, it speaks to a belief that all can be saved and restored to right relation with God. Now, I have no interest in a theological argument about the veracity of the claim. I simply want to hold up the concept because I believe it has a significant impact in how we live our lives, how we perceive and interact with others. It's the real life implication, the real life application that I think is important for us to contemplate. I believe it's the concept of universalism that gives our faith its power. And more importantly, and I do want to highlight this, the internalization of the belief in universalism that has the ability to impact how we live our lives. And I do want to make the distinction between the belief system and the internalization of those beliefs. You see, that verse doesn't matter if you work all day. It says it doesn't matter if you pick more grapes than someone else. You're not worth more than another. You're not more worthy than another. The last shall be first and the first last can be seen as the backbone of a moral code of conduct. Such a belief, if operationalized, would make it impossible 
for one to perceive themselves as superior because of their station in life. It would get in the way of those with more money or more education than another to adopt a perspective of superiority over those with less. It would put to a lie the belief that one is superior because of one's beauty, body size, shape. It would make one sound silly if they made negative assumptions about individuals because they lived in a poor part of town or because they had a particular skin color or a particular sexual orientation. Beliefs of superiority and inferiority get in the way of unity. They impede notions of equality. They separate us one from another. They can blind us to the other's humanity. The so-called right and the so-called left, for example. I associate the theological concept of universalism with our seventh principle. It speaks to respect for the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. It states explicitly, we are part of an interconnected web of existence, meaning we are part of something bigger than our individual selves. The implication is what affects one affects us all. Now I wanna be explicit in juxtaposing our seventh and our first principle. Our first principle states a belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, the individual since it does not state a belief in the equal worth and dignity of every person, it leaves open the possibility that a tall person has more inherent worth than a short one, that one with more money, more academic knowledge has more inherent worth than one with less of either asset. Now, I wanna be careful here because I wanna be clear that I am not demeaning the first principle. It's a powerful statement. It's an important statement. In fact, it's largely what first attracted me to Unitarian Universalism. I thought then, and I think now, a community of faith that explicitly states a belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person would be of a particular attraction to those whose identity has been and or remains marginalized. Inherent worth and dignity of every person. But, but if we look at the demographics of a typical UU congregation, either my presumption was and remains inaccurate or our congregation could benefit from some introspection regarding the lived experience of our first principle. My lived experience of UUism is that there is a great emphasis on the individual and much less attention paid to our interdependence with one another, our interdependence between our congregations or even with the larger communities in which we live. When I've stepped back and attempted to analyze our overarching dynamics, my observations don't surprise me. They do disappoint me sometimes, but they don't surprise. You see, UUism grew up largely during the age of the Enlightenment. I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I am. 
It's a powerful and important construct, folks, but it's flawed. It's ushered in a separation of mind and body, a separation of body and the external. It grounds one's very existence in the thinking mind, a unique and separate mind, the place where our egos reside. It implies one does not have nor requires a connection with the external. So if I am because I think is a foundational notion, it makes perfect sense. One would highly value and vigorously defend one's thoughts and one's beliefs as if one's life depended on it. Such does not bode well for sense of community, sense of inclusion, acceptance. I wanna hold up an alternative narrative, perhaps best framed by the phrase, I am because we are. The concept is captured in the African term, Mbutu. Nelson Mandela defined it as a profound sense that we're human only through the humanity of others. A profound sense that we are human only through the humanity of others. That concept, that phrase, the primary reference point is the other, interrelatedness, not personal thought or belief. It recognizes our personal best interests are inextricably tied to the best interests of the other. Such an organizing principle imposes a sense of moral obligation regarding our responsibility to and for others. Mbutu is a wonderful metaphor for universalism. As I close, I wanna highlight that our seventh principle should be a gift Unitarian Universalism brings to the world. And we should be proud of it and be intentional in sharing that belief system. Our world has been in crisis as of the result of this COVID virus. The expert told us some time ago, the primary tool we have to combat its powerful impact is to minimize the spread of the infection, that each of us must play a role to minimize the spread of the disease. If inherent worth and dignity of every person is one's primary reference point, we run and have run a grave risk that each person will maximize their own worth and dignity, give preference to their own wants, their own needs with potentially catastrophic consequences. What is and has been needed is for each of us to recognize and be driven by the notion, I am because we are. With this as a primary reference point, decisions are made based on what's in the best interest of the whole, the best interest of the web, not what's best for me, myself, and I. We would self-quarantine, not because we like it, but because we are driven by a moral obligation to the greater good.
I ask what better gift could we give to each other and to the world than to be driven by an obligation to what we call the greater good. I think we get there through universalism, not a focus on my own personal inherent worth and dignity. Universalism, may it be so, amen and I share.